At this point, we'll go ahead and do an example of trying to estimate the stability margins of a system. And so this given system, the, this Bode plot of the open loop frequency response, can be used to estimate the stability, the relative stability of the closed loop system. So this is a, important to remember. The open loop frequency response is used to assess the stability of the closed loop system. And so this Bode plot has the form of a system that we're comfortable with, where the magnitude decreases with frequency and where the phase decreases with frequency. And so first we're going to attempt to estimate the phase margin. And so the way we estimate phase margin, if you think back, is we look at the gain crossover frequency so where the magnitude plot crosses zero decibels. And then we go down to the phase plot at that frequency. And we try and estimate how far is the phase plot from crossing minus 180 degrees. So that distance is the phase margin. It's a little hard to see very exactly, but it looks like at that frequency the phase is approximately minus 155 degrees. And minus 155 is 25 degrees above minus 180. So the phase margin, or we sometimes use this symbol phi is approximately 25 degrees. And then similarly, we can try and look at the gain margin. And so typically to assess gain margin, we look at where the phase crosses minus 180 degrees. And so if we look closely, this system's frequency response the phase lag approaches minus 180 degrees, but it never actually crosses minus 180 degrees. So there, there is no phase crossover frequency. So what that means is, in essence, we can increase the gain as much as we want without the system going unstable. So we say that the gain margin is infinite. Okay, since the phase never crosses minus 180 degrees. In practice, you wouldn't want to do that. In practice, you know, when you're really close to minus 180 degrees, you would like to, to stay away from that. Um, there are some good rules of thumb you know, different applications have different sort of requirements, but, you know, but some people talk about uh, a good gain margin being at least six decibels, at least six dBs, and people talk about phase margin wanting at least 30 to 60 degrees of phase margin. Okay. Another thing that frequency response is very good for in addition to analysis of relative stability is for system identification. So in other words, frequency response can be very useful for black box modeling, for trying to back out models of a system um, without performing any sort of first principles based analysis, just by feeding the system inputs and looking at the outputs. So empirically determining a model. And we have done this with the step response data, you know, feed a system a step and try and back out a transfer function that matches the, the step response that, that is observed. With frequency response, instead of using a step, we sweep the system through a range of sinusoidal inputs. So start at low frequencies, sinusoidal inputs, look at the scaling and the phase shift of the output in steady state. 
then step through a whole range of frequencies. A couple of advantages of using a frequency response approach to system identification is that it's helpful for identifying higher order dynamics, um, in particular sort of non-dominant dynamics, faster dynamics, and it's also helpful for identifying zeros. One example that's of practical relevance to electric vehicles is, is the modeling of power converters. And so a frequency response approach is, is commonly employed for generating models of, of power converters. So here's an example. You know, here we have um, an input filter. And here we have a buck converter. And this is the empirically derived Bode plot. And converters are a useful application of this approach because they're nonlinear. You know, they have this switching, um, this on off switching between these sort of two discrete modes, which is a type of nonlinearity. And they can also be higher order, depending on um, what's included in the, in the converter. And so the way that this Bode plot was generated was the system was fed a constant duty cycle. And there was a sinusoidal component added to the duty cycle. So the duty cycle was, was sinusoidally varied about some nominal constant duty cycle. Then the output response of the converter was observed. Um, the change in the output voltage of the converter was observed. Looking at this response in steady state, looking at the scaling of this delta output and the phase shift of this delta output, this Bode plot was generated. So for some single frequency input, the phase was measured, the magnitude was measured, so then a sinusoidal input of a different frequency was input into the system. The phase was observed. The scaling was observed in steady state, and so on. And we generate this, this model. And so one thing that you'll notice is that the frequency response information becomes a little, a little more noisy at high frequencies. And so that's typical because it's, it's much more difficult to sort of measure um, phase shift and, and amplitude sc scaling at, at high frequencies. Another thing you'll notice that's indicative of Bode diagrams in general is that you sort of have these big jumps in frequency. But they're a little misleading because you know, factors of 360 are essentially the very same phase. So, you know, if you're 180 degrees ahead, that's the same as being 180 degrees behind or 540 or whatever. So this aspect sort of adds a little bit of ambiguity, makes the Bode plot a little bit harder to, to interpret. Um, so this is another reason why with higher order systems, we may prefer to use the Nyquist plot for analysis. In this case, this Bode plot, if we were to back out a model, if we were to back out a linear model, in essence, it has averaged sort of the, the two switching states of the converter, the state with the switch on and the state with the switch off. And in essence, we've gotten a linear model of a nonlinear system. And it turns out that using this sort of average model, this average linear model, makes the simulation run faster, significantly faster, and it makes analysis easier. You know, you can actually um, apply all the linear analysis tools that, we, that we've learned. Um, and it happens to, to work pretty well. Um, this approximate model tends to work pretty well for frequencies that are below the switching frequency and near the duty cycle about which the sort of analysis was performed. 
So here we'll perform a little example to try and exemplify how we might experimentally derive a Bode plot. So you might imagine that we have some system and we fed it an input, a sinusoidal input, this blue line. And the output signal is this red dashed line. So we have some system, you know, a motor, a converter. We, maybe we have a, a signal generator on the input generating a sinusoidal input of some frequency. And we have some data acquisition on the output or a, an oscilloscope or something. And we get some, some output. And so we know that for linear systems in steady state, the output will be a sinusoid of the same frequency, but it will be scaled and shifted. And so with this red line, you can sort of see there's a little bit of a transient component here where it's, it's kind of decaying a little bit. But eventually, it reaches steady state where you have this constant sinusoid. And the red line and the blue line have the same frequency, but they are scaled. So the amplitude of the output is different than the amplitude of the input, and they're phase shifted. The peaks don't necessarily line up. And so if we want to generate this Bode diagram experimentally, we want to estimate this scaling, and we want to estimate this phase shift. So we'll go ahead and do that from this plot. Um, so first off, let's try and estimate what the frequency of the input is. Presumably we know that, but let's do it all the same. So the way that we can estimate frequency is based on period. The period of a sinusoid is the amount of time it takes to perform one cycle. So if we look at this, so this blue line, you know, the time it takes to go from valley to valley. That's one period. And it's a little hard to, to see precisely what, what the, the period is, but it looks like maybe this valley is at about 14 seconds and maybe this valley is at about 22 seconds. So approximately eight, eight seconds is the period. And if we were working with data uh, in MATLAB or some other program, we could, we could more precisely identify um, the locations of these peaks and valleys. But for our purposes of this example, eight seconds is good enough. In general, period is the inverse of frequency. So frequency, if we're in hertz, is just 1 divided by the period. We work with radians per second, so the frequency is 2 pi divided by period. 2 pi divided by 8 seconds is pi over 4 radians per second in decimals. That's approximately 0.785. So that's the input frequency. We can then look at the magnitude or the scaling of our system. And we can do that by looking at the relative amplitudes. So we compare the amplitude of the output to the amplitude of the input. And so looking at this, the input oscillates between minus 2 and plus 2. So it has an amplitude of 2. The output, if we look at it, it's not centered about 0. So we have to be a little bit careful. But it looks like maybe the peak is somewhere in the neighborhood of 2.5. And this valley is somewhere in the neighborhood of negative 3.5. So 2.5 plus 
plus 3.5 is 6. And so that means that it has an amplitude of about 3. And so again, you know, that's not very precise because we're just picking these values off of a graph. But if we were in MATLAB or we had access to the raw data, we could really zoom in and look at particular instances of, date, of time. And so that means that at this frequency, the magnitude is 1.5. And since we plot things in terms of decibels, take 20 log of 1.5 and that means that the magnitude is approximately 3.5 dBs at that frequency. So there we have basically one data point in our magnitude plot. So at a frequency of 0.785 radians per second we have a magnitude of 3.5 decibels. And then we can do a similar thing for phase. So if we look at this, you can see that the output is, is lagging behind the input, which is typical. So, you know, the input reaches its peak, but the output doesn't reach its peak until some time later, you know, which is generally going to be the case. The output is going to uh, lag behind the, the input. And so it's a little hard to tell but that distance call our our lag it looks like it's maybe if that total is five somewhere between one and two seconds I would say but let's just for to make the math easier let's just say that the phase is minus two seconds okay and it's negative because the output is lagging behind the input but we don't plot phase in terms of seconds we plot phase in terms of degrees so we want to understand what this two seconds means in terms of the overall period. If we have a phase lag of two seconds where our period is eight seconds, that means that the phase lag is like two eighths of a cycle or one quarter of a cycle. And since one cycle equals 360 degrees, that means that our phase is approximately minus 90 degrees. And therefore, we've got a point on our phase plot now. So at that given frequency, we can plot a phase of minus 90. We would then repeat this process for a whole range of frequencies and plot point by point, filling out this Bode diagram to sort of capture the, the system's behavior in the range of frequencies that's of interest to us. So let's say that hypothetically we've done that. We've swept through a whole range of frequencies for our analysis of a, of a particular system, and we've generated this Bode diagram. And so now what we want to do is we want to back out a transfer function that matches this frequency response. And we'll try to point out some of the advantages of employing a frequency response approach to system identification rather than using a step response, for example. So if we look at this, do you think that the system has any integrators or differentiators? What do you think? So how we can tell 
is by looking at the system's behavior at low frequencies. If you recall, uh, an integrator, it slopes downward at minus 20 dBs per decade um, for all frequencies, and a differentiator slopes upward at plus 20 dBs per decade at all frequencies. Since at low frequencies here, our Bode plot is, is flat, the magnitude plot is flat, that means that our system has no integrators or differentiators. So no integrators or differentiators. slope of the magnitude plot equals zero at DC. So we'll say DC meaning uh, constant input, a direct current input, um, where a constant input would correspond to a frequency of zero. So our Bode plot never actually reaches zero but you can imagine that zero is the limit as we move to the left in our frequency response plot. Some people may say, well, maybe it does have an integrator or maybe it does have a differentiator, but they just cancel. You know, you have an integrator, an S in the denominator, and a differentiator, an S in the numerator, and they cancel. And that's very well possible, but if you have an integrator and a differentiator that cancel, it's as if they're not there anyways. Um, you know, the, the system's behavior or the, the response of a system where you have a cancellation like that is identical to as if the integrator and differentiator were never there. So now, going further, let's try to estimate the DC gain of the system. So the DC gain, or the gain of the system at small frequencies, we can see is equal to 40 dBs. So that's what the, the magnitude is equal to in the limit as we move to the left. And so if we wanted to convert this back to non-decibels, if we wanted to know what the DC gain was, you know, some value k, uh, not in decibels, we could use the fact that decibels equals 20 log k. And then we can simply solve for k. So if we wanted to solve for k, isolate k, we would divide both sides by 20. So you have 40, you divide through by 20. But then you're left with log k. So think about how, how do we isolate k? How do we get k out of that log? Well, the way that you do that is you raise both sides to the power 10. Because an exponential is the inverse of a logarithm of the same base. So that since we have a logarithm of base 10, we raise both sides to the power 10. We get 10 to the second power. So we get that k is approximately 100. So that gives us some information about our system. Let's now try and assess um, poles and zeros. So now the question is, what's the relative number of poles as compared to zeros? The way that we can assess that is to sort of look at the limit of the system's behavior as omega gets large. So as omega gets large, we've sort of surpassed all of the break frequencies of all of our poles and zeros. So if we look here, we can see that the phase approaches minus 180 degrees. And we can see that the magnitude plot, its slope approaches a certain value. So it's like, so this is 10 to the fourth, which is 10,000. This is like 9,000, 8,000. This is about 7,000 radians per second. This is 1,000. 
This is 900, 800, 700. So between those two points, it's approximately one decade, one factor of 10 change in frequency. And if we look at the change in magnitude, we went from a value of about minus 20 dBs down to a value of about minus 60 dBs. So this slope, the rise over run, so we rise about negative 40 dBs and we run about a decade. So looking at this in the limit, the phase approaches minus 180 and the slope of the magnitude plot approaches minus 40 dBs per decade. And so this indicates to me that we have two more poles than zeros. Because if you think about what happens in the limit, each pole contributes minus 90 degrees of phase lag and minus 20 dBs per decade of slope in the magnitude plot. And since our phase goes to minus 180 and our slope goes to minus 40 dBs per decade, it appears that we have two poles, or at least two more poles than zeros. Then we try to identify breaks. And so if you look at this, you know, the phase is always going downward. The slope is always getting more negative. So it, it appears that there aren't any zeros. Or if there are zeros, um, they're at least being canceled by a nearby pole. And that's because if we had a zero, you know, the slope would go upwards. If you remember what the magnitude plot of a zero is, it starts out flat and then it goes up to plus 20 dBs per decade. And the phase starts at zero and then it goes up to plus 90. And since the phase never bumps up and the magnitude never bumps up, it appears that we don't have any zeros, or at least any zeros whose effect is, is felt. In order to estimate the location of our poles, it's a little tough. Um, but, you know, it seems like we've sort of reached steady state out here. So it seems like we're before that. And an approximate guess is maybe near minus 45 and near minus 135. You know, you can sort of see we're flat and then in this region the slope starts to go down. And then here we s seem to have maybe another break where the slope sort of gets steeper. And this is very imprecise and there are much better ways to do this and there are software tools um, that can do this much better. Uh, MATLAB itself actually has a system identification toolbox. But just for our sort of intuition, we'll estimate the location of these poles as such. So it looks like we have a break at, this is one radian per second, so this is two, three, four. So. like we have a break maybe near 4 radians per second and then a break maybe near about 100 and so based on that we could estimate a transfer function it has a DC gain of 100 and it has a pole with a break frequency of 4. So if we put it into Bode form, you know, we'll have this K and then we'll have a simple pole where we put it into Bode form uh, 1 over TS plus 1 where T, where 1 over T is the break frequency. So if the break frequency is 4, then T is 1 over 4. And likewise the other pole has a T of 1 over 200. So this is a very rough estimate of the system's transfer function. And so one advantage of this approach, as opposed to using the step response plot, is that it allows us to identify the sort of the faster pole. 
So this pole at 100 is 25 times faster than the pole at 4. And so if we looked at the step response, it would be very hard to see the effect of that very fast pole because it's not dominant. But by looking at the frequency response plot, we can see its effect and we're able to identify it. Similarly, if we had had zeros in this system, we would have seen the magnitude bump up, we would have seen the phase bump up, and we would have been able to estimate the exact location of that zero. So this is um, advantageous uh, in many ways for performing system identification.